questions questions about poll EV. Sorry, that was me. I realized it was not recording. <laughs> so I fixed it. Okay. I'll I'll share that I, I definitely uh, upvoted the nervous. Like when I had to speak today for like a second at the teaching tree welcome, I was like, oh my God, I forgot how terrifying that first day of class type thing is always like it doesn't matter how many years it doesn't matter if you're all it's terrifying and I hate it and now I realize it's going to happen in a week and like multiple times so that was where I went mm -hmm. yeah I'm feeling that too right right now um, the advice that we got in the last session those of you who went about having students do things on the first day and affirming activities is something that's helped me over that nervousness really put it in their hands let them do the work on the first day and then you go oh these guys are cool and then it almost immediately goes away uh, so building that space for them to shine i think is is helpful all right well we don't have tons of time so um welcome you guys uh we'll get started um jordan and i are happy to see you all and um, we hope you guys enjoy this session. Uh, my name is Jason Kulchik. I'm in the English department. Jordan, did you wanna? Sure, my name is Jordan Smiley and I teach in the fashion department. Okay, so if you're participating in other sessions at Catalyst, which I'm sure you are, um, you're gonna get a lot of great stuff on building activities, engaging your students. Um, this session is less about that um, it's less about the instructional design. It's more about just quick quality of life tips for once you've built that content, um, administering it or facilitating it or presenting to your students. So um, these are just some tips that Jordan and I have developed through our practice of teaching online. They may work for you, um, but more so they should just be an example of some of the things you should develop on your own. Get your own style um, of, of how to organize your content and distribute it to your students in the most efficient and seamless way. Um, so, like I said, just some quick tips. I'm gonna do those in the first half and then Jordan's going to um, show us some of her presentation and um, scheduling techniques in the second half. Uh, so we just did sort of a warm up using Poll EV. Um, another tip that I have, and this may be just me is, uh, itineraries, building strong itineraries um, that really kind of communicate the, the course content and move me through the different steps. Um, having a really strong itinerary might seem like you're confining everything you do to class to this very regimented on a rail thing. I would argue that having a strong itinerary actually gives you the opportunity to go off the rails and go where students want to go with content. Um, but also having a way to get back to where you need to be. So I use Google Docs. Um, and the cool thing about this is, um, maybe I'll get back, I seem to skip one of these things in my itinerary. Um, the cool thing about using Google Docs is you can embed links that are easily accessible. So I use chat, like we use Google Slides, we use Padlet, we use whatever it is constantly um, in my class. We move from activity to activity. Now, if I have 50 windows open or I need to look at my email or quickly log into something, um, it gets slow and your students will see a lot of this. Just kind of clicking around, nothing really happening. Um, so this really helps me to deliver the activities quickly. So for example, um, we have an itinerary here. I'm going to click this and you can do a variety of things. You can pull it up just by clicking on the link here or you can automatically copy the link. So I can, in just a matter of seconds at two keystrokes, drop that into chat so that students can follow along and you guys can follow along. Is my screen? Yeah, my screen's shared. Um, so you guys can follow along with this itinerary. And we've also embedded a bunch of links for resources um, if you have questions about some of the tools or techniques that we're using. Uh, so that's one thing that I would say has been super helpful for me. 
And the second tip that I would have is if you can try to use two monitors. Um, this is super helpful for organization. Those of you guys who teach in Zoom um, know that it's easy to lose windows behind other windows. So um, it may cost a little bit more. Um, I definitely invested in one when we switched in spring of uh, 2020. I also bought an iPad and a stylus and I found that it's made it easier for me. So if you if you can, uh, it's just, again, one of these, it's not a deal breaker, it's not required, but it's kind of a quality of life upgrade. And figure out your style for um, setting up your monitors. So there is a tool or just a um, hotkey trick you can use using Windows. Those of you who use Mac can maybe help me out with this, but basically if you press the Windows symbol and an arrow direction, you can snap your screens um, perfectly in half. So you can um, showcase, or when you're using your own monitors, uh, just for your own benefit, you can split up the content rather than sort of going through the process and manually, manually doing that. Uh, can you go so, through that one more time, Jason? Yeah. So um, here I have my itinerary and let's say on one side of the screen, I wanted to look at my itinerary and on the other side, I wanted to look at the Zoom window so I could see all of my students. I would just click on the window itself, kind of the thing that holds the content. And once that's selected, you just press the Windows key and I'm gonna say the right uh, arrow key. And then it'll ask you what you want to be broadcast on the other side. And I do have a link for um, how to do this. It says Windows key and arrow keys. It's just something that was a game changer for me. I spent years of my life not knowing about this. My uh, cousin mentioned it and I'm like, wow, it's so much better than like manually minu minimizing, et cetera. Um, but for me, this is the style that I use right here. I have two monitors and the left monitor is basically just for me, but my students will see what's happening on the right side monitor. So I have my itinerary over here on the left-hand side. Again, I can quickly get links. I can pull those links over to the screen on the right that my students are um, currently watching. But I can also see you guys and see the reactions and see when um, things are going well, or maybe there's some confusion and things like that. And also keep an eye on chat. Although um, Zoom keeps experimenting with their format and this is getting trickier and trickier having gallery right here and chat. But basically I have three windows here on two screens. So as I'm presenting over here, I can um, annotate if I need to um, using an iPad. And I find that's really helpful, okay? So again, um, just a, a tip on, on how I set up my screens um, and my monitors, okay? Um, so uh, one other thing I would suggest when you're building your itinerary is making space to do some of the behind the scenes activities. Um, so like with breakout groups, um, oftentimes I'll have students with uh, ASL interpreters or um, people who help them. And so you can't just use the randomized breakout group. So it does take a sec. You have to assign people into uh, specific areas. So what I'll do is I'll have an activity that they can do. Like for example, in this class from um, last semester, I had them read a prompt before I got them into their breakout groups for the uh, project that they were gonna do. Um, but that allowed me with a little bit of a reminder there in red to take care of that behind the scenes activity. Again, try to make these um, transitions from thing to thing as seamless as possible. I found it's not gonna happen every time and there are gonna be times where you're grasping and uh, trying to find something really quickly. Um, but the less often that happens, the more um, chance that you'll have that your students are staying with you. Here I have uh, saved data in red because I, give my students a poll about um, 
their familiarity with the uh, support services at Mesa. And I like to show them the results of that poll sort of tabulated with my other classes in the next class. I've lost that before because um, sometimes you can forget to save, et cetera. So just uh, preparing for those types of behind the scenes, um, things I've found to be super helpful. Okay, any questions? I feel like I'm going quickly, but this is, yeah. I have a question, Jason. Yeah, please. Um, were you using like a one of those like pencil stencils? I don't know what they're called to like do the circle and mm -hmm. um, write on the screen or yes. were you using your mouse? Um, I am using a stylus. So again, this oh, is stylus, another, yeah. yeah, pencil stencil. I think you had it. Just got to uh, combine those two. Uh, but yeah, this is something that I was very much against my whole life. I was like, if you're going to study literature, you need to read a textbook. You need to write with the physical thing. Um, but coming to learn online, but also um, seeing how it works with students uh, was really helpful for me. And I've learned um, that annotating online in Zoom can be a really powerful thing. So that's where I did want to go next. Um, using an iPad uh, for whiteboards or lectures and things like that. So um, like I said, oftentimes I'll be presenting something um, on this side of the screen. Students will be engaging in conversation. I'll have a prompt or something. Uh, we'll be talking about an article and they'll say things and I can just go ahead and write right on the screen. Um, everything they said, keep track, um, key concepts and things like that. I find it super helpful. So that's when I am sharing the screen from my main computer um, uh, sort of um, login. I can also log in and share what I have on my iPad, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that um, because I, I'm not sure this account has privileges, but I'm going to try. So Jason, just quick. to clarify, I have a yeah. question about that. Please. You you're actually logged in twice, once on your iPad and once on your computer, and you yeah. just are looking at your iPad and going annotate using the annotate feature on that. Is that correct? Exactly. Um, I was using the Zoom annotate feature in that last demonstration. And there is a link to um, Michelle's video, actually, which taught me how to do this a couple semesters back in the itinerary. What I'm doing now is I'm sharing on the iPad itself. So yes, you will log in to two different accounts, one on your computer and one on, um, let's see, I'll run the jewels in my email. Um, but when you do it from your uh, iPad, there's a variety of things that you can do. Um, so I have PDF here and, P and uh, Adobe is a really good, if you don't have an account um, that you can use, talk to the district IT, they'll definitely work um, with you on that. Well, they work with me, so hopefully they'll work with you. Um, but I use uh, PDFs. So like I teach literature, this is from one of my literature classes. Um, so for example, we did James Joyce, uh, short story Araby and I often start a class after they've read with just initial impressions. So um, this gives us a chance to get these ideas out, you know, um, and, but get them documented just like you would in a lecture. Uh, so I try to document what they say. So they were talking about how this there were, this was sort of a building's Roman, um, different allusions, things that they focus on. Then we can go into the text and close read specific moments, right? Um, which when you study literature is really important. And I would imagine um, that this could be helpful uh, annotating text in, in many other classes. You can zoom in and things like that um and really dig into the text it sits there so um, everybody can see it and things like that but what i really like is then there's a collection of um, things that we've worked on together uh, so i'm going to switch back to my other screen and i got to finish up really quickly so i'll try to do that um but what i like to do is uh have, I'm sorry, I've lost the uh, itinerary here. 
a repository. Now, Michael, last session that we had um, suggested that he puts, rather than use links from um, an itinerary, uh, he builds in Canvas, this is the stuff we're working on that day. So he trains the students or they just get used to it, like, hey, this is where we're gonna have our Google Doc or our Padlet or whatever and things like that. That's a really cool idea for me. Um, this works for me. But again, you, you wanna develop the strategy that works best for you. Um, but like I said, working on collaborative annotations and things like that, Google Docs, Google Slides, I know there's gonna be a couple of presentations around these things. Um, sharing that on Canvas with students students really appreciate that because they can go back and see like wait what were we talking about in this passage um, because maybe that will be on the midterm so in my 216 english 216 is british lit i had a folder that they could access called stuff we made and again it's just a collection of the things that we did in our synchronous uh class session so like for example it might be um a pdf like this that we that we um worked up or a set of Google Slides, okay? Um, so those are pretty much all my tips for today. Um, you can ask questions now really quickly or save them till the end because we do want to give Jordan enough time. I think Dora had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just curious where you share this information. So I know you share the link, but later for students to access it, where do they find it? Do you have like a folder for them? Because I've been using Google Slides Mm -hmm. for all of my agendas and they have links and things like that um i have them in a module for like class content i'm trying to think of a uh, and you might know the answer to this jason i'm trying to think of an easier way where like they will always have access to our agendas without an extra click like i want to put them on my home page for like and then just build them like agenda week one and i'm like how do you share this with them because it's really valuable information i have a lot of content too and i want them to be able to follow along and go back to it later? That's a really good question. And I think it would probably depend on the context of what you're doing. Like, um, for example, a lot of times I will share um, slides and things that we did in that weekly module. Like we just read okay. this article. Um, so, hey, here's what you guys did in class. But if you know you're always gonna have these things you want, them to have maybe in your modules at the top the first module because i i do mine by weeks you just have um things we worked on together you know as as like your first uh module michael did you want to uh did you have a suggestion about that like where do you keep your module with like that the daily resources um i include them as a sub module for each day of class so it's like it's a, the main module with all their activities. And then right after it is the sub module that has all the, the stuff we'll do in this day. So they get just used to this process of module, what we do in class, in class. So it, it's a little unwieldy when you look at it all at once, but when they get used to doing it piece by piece, day by day, then it, it after about a week or two, they it, it, it makes sense. And I think that's just the best advice. Find what works best with your style, the context of what you're doing and what your students are figuring out and what and adjust when they aren't figuring it out and, and they're not accessing those things. So that's um, sort of just some quality of life tips um, for how to conduct a synchronous session that have been helpful for me. Um, and Jordan's going to show us some tips on uh, different presentation techniques. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Um, so I also do a thing where I use multiple viewing screens, but I don't have multiple monitors. What I do is I actually use my phone and a webcam and then I log into every Zoom meeting twice. So if you're looking like on the gallery view, you should see my screen, but you also see a screen that just has like a piece of paper on it. It says JS iPhone. That's my phone and it's currently logged in right now because it has a different view. So um, I'm going to kind of go over what I did last semester in a class I taught fully synchronously and it worked really well with me. Um, so I'm going to switch my camera view, first of all. Uh, let's see, sorry, this is, I totally do that thing you said, Jason, where I'm like, oh, look, I'm clicking around. <laughs> I do that a lot. Oh, well, that's all right. Let's see, backgrounds and filters. I have to turn off my background first. So uh, just ignore my messy background. I don't normally, have it that bad. 
So now I'm going to share to my um, webcam that I have set up and you can see it's now aiming at a dress form. And I'm going to go ahead and if you are the host and you have the view set up, you can click or hover your mouse on that little window of the camera that you want to show up for everybody and you'll see three little dots show up. And if you click on that, you can say either pin or spotlight for everyone. And if you choose spotlight, then it makes it big, but it keeps it big. So even when other people are talking, if they have it in speaker view, it's gonna keep your screen as the big screen. So I use this a lot on my dress form so I can just demonstrate the draping techniques and such, and I can zoom in. It's just a little webcam on a tripod. It works really, really well. Um, I also keep my own screen up for myself to see so that I can see my students' faces as I go. So I actually keep it in gallery view so I can see if someone has a question or raising their hand, but then the video is spotlighted for my students so they don't see it in gallery view, they see the big giant screen. So something else I have, and I actually have it set up so I can show you right here, is this is actually my phone and it's on just a little like kind of boom arm and the phone is set so that I can show when I switch from the dress form to patterning because um, in my classes, it's very, very hands-on and I'm actually gonna spotlight that video right now for you. So I have to switch a lot from, um, you know, the dress form to the table to, you know, the iron. So it's easier for me if I have everything just kind of already set up. And this way I can really zoom in and students can see as I'm drawing like an exact line where they intersect because it's all about really fine points and details. But, you know, you could use this for like any document that you wanted to share. It basically just works just like a doc cam. Um, but I also use this for when I have to demonstrate on my sewing machine because, um, let me flip the camera real quick. Okay, so I can also just rotate the angle and then all of a sudden, now I'm showing you a setting on my sewing machine. And if I'm sewing a little thing, you can see exactly where the lines are and all that. So that works really well for me and my students really like it because it's up close. And uh, to be honest with you, I've had students tell me that they prefer this to the in-person section because they can actually see it better. And so it's, um, it's pretty interesting to actually have that reaction from them, but it, it works pretty well. And um, this was uh, relatively cheap, I would say for me. Um, basically the little like boom arm that I have my phone on was only like $20, I wanna say. And the webcam was like one that came with my computer. Um, so like it was very affordable and I just use my phone for the other videos. So it's, it's totally fine. So that's nice about that. Uh, let's see. So I'm gonna switch my camera back to my face again so you can see me there, see, hello. <laughs> All right, um, let's see what else. So something else that I do is um, I do use Google Slides a lot because in my synchronous sessions, um, what I will do is I will talk about something and demonstrate, for example, like a, I'll demonstrate a draping technique and then I want them to try it. And it's really hard if I'm trying to look at like 24 tiny little screens and see what everybody's doing. So what I'll do is I will set up a Google Slides um, sheet ahead of time before class. And I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. So this is our itinerary, but if uh, you click on the Google Slides, it's gonna take you to a document that I already have set up. And this is one that I do with my class where I'll say, okay, now we've practiced some different techniques. Um, you have four options and I'll show them these four. And I say, which one do you wanna do? 
And then I'll put them into breakout rooms according to which bodice they wanna try. And then they are not just doing it themselves, they're there with the other students and they're trying it on their own dress forms and they're helping each other. And then I pop back and forth between the rooms and that tends to um, really help them a lot because they get that interaction with each other that they normally miss in the classroom. So they like that. Um, but something else I do with the Google Slides is you can always just say share and you can uh, copy the link and then go back to here. Now if I put that in the chat, now you guys could all access that Google document and you could see the slides or whatever. So you'd know what document you're supposed to be working off of while I was working with you. Um, and when you do that setting of the sharing of the Google Slides, you can choose whether you want the students to just be able to view it or just to be able to edit it. Because um, like for the first one here, I'm gonna go back to that sharing again. For the first exercise that I had them do, um, it's just a draping. So I just wanted them to just play around with it and come up with a draping plan. But for the second one, um, or I'm sorry, down here actually, the third one, I actually asked them to write a written answers next to it. So what I would do then is the sharing, I would, I would change this to an editor and then I copy the link and then they'd actually be able to type on the slides. So then they can do that interactive as well. So that's nice. Let's see. Um, So one other little tip that I wanted to share about um, what I do with mine, let me fix this. Okay, there, sorry. Is that um, I tend to do one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with my students. Um, so, uh, and this is, it does take more time, but I have had really, really good results with it. And what I will do is I will set up this is outside of office hours, like uh, when we have a big project due, for example. So for our midterm project, I have to really get up close and evaluate their draping projects and see it in person and go over it. And I don't have time to do that with everybody in class. So I have them schedule a one on one appointment with me for like about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, my class is small. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's that class particular is only like 22 students or something. So. I meet with them on Zoom and then we go over it up close and they hold their phone and go up close to the dress form and show me everything and all that. And that works pretty well. But, um, you know, I don't do that all the time because that would be like my whole work schedule, right? Half hour meeting like for every student every week. So that's usually just for big projects. But um, what I do do for my other classes is I do what are called weekly check-ins which are probably about four times a semester. Um, I'm, I ask them to pick a time slot and I set this up using either Calendly or Canvas Scheduler. Um, I've used both, uh, they both work really well and I've put links to both on our itinerary so you can access those as well. Um, but I set them up and I, it allows you to set up time slots that you have available. So you can say, okay, I'm free Monday from one to three, Tuesday from two to four, et cetera. And students sign up for like a 10 minute time slot and then they meet with you. And the only point of that is literally just to check in and be like, hey, how are you doing? And how's this class going for you? And is there anything you're struggling with? And it's just a really nice way to be able to reach out because um, whether you're synchronous or asynchronous, it's really hard to get that one-on-one -on -one connection with the students. And so I've found that those like quick little 10 minute meetings just a couple times a semester makes a big difference. Um, so I really like both of those programs, the Calendly and the Canvas Scheduler. Um, Canvas is already, or the scheduler is already built into Canvas, so that's nice. But Calendly is free and it does um, build right in. You can just copy the link and paste it right into Canvas as well. And honestly, I prefer the format. I think it's a little easier to navigate, but that's just my opinion. Um, and those were basically my tips that I had to share with you guys. Does anyone have any questions they wanted to ask? Nope. Do you have any points associated with those check-in appointments? Jordan? I do, that's great. Yeah, actually um, I make them mandatory and I provide enough uh, time windows that students can choose any time that works best for them. 
Um, and it, I make it like a low stakes appointment or a low stakes assignment, you know, like 10 points or something, but it is mandatory. And I do give participation points for it. Can I just ask when you, um, when the students get together separately to work on the, the bodice project, yeah. how, how do they see what each other is doing? So they are on a gallery view within their breakout room. Okay. Um, have, have you done a breakout rooms at all yet? Yeah. Okay, so it's just like there, I keep it fairly small. I don't do more than four students in a breakout room. And so they, they see each other and they have their cameras on and they share that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of show what they're working on. Exactly, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, um, and so they, most of them will, I'm sorry, most of them will yeah. have their form like right behind them. <laughs> so they'll okay. be looking at the screen and they'll have their form right there. Um, but yeah. if not, they'll always just turn their phone around and show the form that way. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you have another one? I think I cut you off while you were. No, no okay. <laughs> that was helpful, yeah. <laughs> good, good. Do you, do you find your students signing in like you on their iPhone and on their computer? Uh, I've had a couple do that, um, not a whole bunch. The few that have actually did it because um, I tried something new last semester and I tried offering an, a book that we got for free at the library as, a, as the textbook. And so um, those that didn't wanna purchase the hard copy, they would log in on their computer so they could see the textbook and then log into Zoom with their phone. So it wasn't like both logging into Zoom, but it was two screens for them and they liked that. Great. Okay, well, uh, if nobody has anything else, I think, uh, Jason, you had one more little activity. Um, yes, uh, just kind of one final bonus tip. Um, I, I do uh, in, make participation part of the grade in my classes. Um, I know maybe some of you do, some of you don't. Um, but just an easy way to do attendance without having to go through the rigmarole at the beginning of class of calling on everybody or keeping track. Um, I use a uh, end of session attendance participation kind of check in Google Doc that I set up in a template and I will um, sort of uh, customize it for each class, depending on what we're doing. Um, and I found it really interesting and helpful. Um, I'll share an example from that same literature class. Um, so students would grade themselves on participation for the session. And in, in my opinion, they're always more than fair, um, but they also feel more invested in the class. And um, I have student sort of testimonials where they're like this part of the, act, the um, our class structure um, made them want to participate more and contribute their voice more often. Um, so they give themselves a grade. But again, this is the most interesting part for me and things that I can use to direct the course of the class moving forward. Like what do they want to see um, next class? What didn't we cover or what, what wasn't clear? Because it seemed clear to me when we were talking about it, but I often find out that um, a certain uh, part of our conversation wasn't coming through um, as clearly. And so we'll return to that. Um, so I did um, have one for us. If you guys want, you don't, you can. If you don't, that's fine. I too. already threw it in the chat, Jason. Okay. <laughs> nice. So you should come to, uh, we should all have an assistant, uh, sort of like a astromech droid in Star Wars to handle all the behind the scenes activities. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so yeah, if you guys wanted to contribute um, to this, that'd be great. Uh, give us some ideas. Um, we'd love to hear what's working for you guys, and we'd love to steal that and incorporate that into our own um, practice. But also, if anything wasn't clear and you do want to leave an email, um, we can start a dialogue uh, that way or even uh, collaborate on projects in the future. So it might be a way for us to connect that way. Has anyone used the attendance button on Canvas? I have. Uh, do you use it, Jason? I don't. Oh. Yeah, I actually really like it. Uh, it's nice because I, for my um, synchronous classes, that's how I would take attendance from mm -hmm. the Zoom, and then it would count that as participation points because right. you can just make it the assignment. Yeah. 
Okay. Was it easy to edit, Jordan? Because um, the so time easy. I wanted to try to use it, it just was so like it, oh, if they're like no. 10 minutes late, you know, it was like, it was just, oh, I found well, out you can edit it. You can like, you know, say that they're late or that they left yes. early or that, you know, whatever their contribution was. So that's easy to yes. do. Um, yeah, there aren't a whole bunch of options in the Canvas attendance tool. It's pretty much like late, they didn't show up, they were there or they're excused. Is I thought you could edit like that. Or options. Um, How do you access I, You it? might be able to, Just I'm not sure. Are, are okay. uh, you but, have to um, drag it up. It's one of the apps like, oh, okay. in the settings because it's not normally on. The one thing I will say as a, as a note about it, yeah, there should be an attendance one there, Jason. Yeah, it's right below discussions, uh, is that it puts a grade in the grade book. And so students sometimes freak out about that grade in the grade book, which is just based on like all or nothing for them showing up. Uh -huh. uh, it's not a yeah. bad thing, but they do kind of get yeah. scared. Yeah, it's actually kind of worked to my advantage when they freak out because they're like, oh, she noticed. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> so I don't know. So attendance yeah, you exactly. choose as a grade percentage, right? For like participation. Cause my attendance is like your short and it's participation, right? So mm -hmm. be here, be present, you get points. Yes. Kind of thing. Yeah. So what I do, I have an assignment group that's called participation and then uh -huh. the attendance sits in that assignment group. Okay. Okay. That's how I do it. But, okay. Thanks mm -hmm. for the logistics behind yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. And Jason, since you haven't used it before, if you're in person, it actually is like a seating chart way that you can put it out. So you can actually put students where they sit and it's real convenient when you're like getting to know names because you're like yeah. moving them around the class. Oh, well, that's cool. That maybe brings up uh, a question that I had for Jordan and everybody else. Jordan mentioned that teaching online has even been better using these tools. Um, uh, the, the presentation of when she's demonstrating are there things that you guys have incorporated teaching online that you're also going to pull back to the classroom? I'll share. Yeah. Um, I since I'm doing I'm doing the same thing as you are, Jason. I have I have two computers and one is my t uh, my laptop that I'm writing on. And um, since I've been writing so many notes, I've created this arsenal of awesome notes that even when we go back to class, I'll have all of these online notes that I can just use in class. And so I don't think the students realize that everything I'm doing in class are just notes that I have on a, on a screen they can't see. I'm just copying work that I've done from like the last semester. So, I mean, it's different with math, right? Because we're doing the same process over and over a lot of times, but yeah, I feel like I've create I, I'm Kelly and I are joking when we get back to campus we're going to burn all of our books and all of our big binders with worksheets in them because we don't need them anymore I think that's interesting and as Hannah says to bring as much of this with us as possible so this doesn't seem like a waste of time but it's also a, a time to innovate like and move past mm -hmm. old modalities students are so technologized at this point you know um, so I totally see myself annotating in class on an iPad while showing it up on Zoom rather than using that dot cam, which I never, I never really liked, so I never really did. So I, what I would do is I'd, I'd broadcast on the whiteboard using the projector and just use the whiteboard to annotate, which is nice, but as soon as you move the text, now you have to erase everything. So that's just something I'm going to bring from this experience back to the face-to-face um, -face sessions. Oh, just uh, jumping onto that, something I'm going to bring is that um, I've been recording a lot of demos about sewing techniques and fashion techniques and stuff, and I'm going to actually keep a lot of them, I think, and look at it as more of like a way to flip my classroom and have them watch the videos at home and then come in and then they practice it. And then I'm just there to help them and make sure they understand it. So we'll see how that goes, but that's my plan. Yeah, I think that's really good. Move the time together to doing something and mm -hmm. sort of that more um, individuated support rather than here's a Exactly. Lecture. Plus I've noticed in the past, um, you know, cause we, we have open lab hours for students that don't have machines at home and they can come in. And so, you know, back when we were in person, but <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, I would see students in there and they would be like furiously looking through their notes and things. And so it would be really cool if they just had a video they could go back to and watch it again, you know, and that way they can pause it and stop it and slow it down. And it's much easier for them to see it. Yeah. Cool. Well, 
thank you guys for coming. Um, this was a really fun session for us and hopefully you found it useful. We're yeah, open to you stick guys. around. We have more time. So uh, if you guys want any more questions, any more ideas, that's fine. Otherwise, um, enjoy. I hope you enjoyed your first day at Catalyst. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Is he done, Jordan? Yeah, I think I'm going to stop the recording.